and here we are. Here we are. Here we stand. This is Das Criminal Podcast coming to you on your podcast app of choice. Uh, this is Amr recording from Toronto. And this is Aaron recording from not Toronto. I feel like everywhere in the world should be classified as Toronto or not Toronto. That's a good way to uh, apply geography, I think. Toronto centric. Yes, very. The new Ford model. Toronto nationalism. So, what are we talking about today? Uh, well, this is a special Easter episode focusing on some of the revolutionary women of the Republic of Ireland's anti-colonial struggle. Um, I mean, really, women were indispensable in the battle for Irish freedom, and many were considered criminals uh, and were jailed for their activities uh, in the struggle for freedom. If you're interested in learning more about the people we're going to discuss, there's a really great book. It's called Women of the Irish Revolution by historian Liz Gillis. And we reference it uh, many times throughout this podcast episode, so please check it out. I don't think it's in print any longer because I had to order a thrifted copy, but you might be able to find it online or at your local library once that's you know safe to visit. So we picked a few profiles from that that we're going to go over today. And uh, an interesting fact, according to the bio of the author, Liz Gillis, she grew up in the Liberties in Dublin, which is where I also lived when I lived in Dublin. Did you want to talk about uh, a particular incident that happened there? I do. I mean, I have many. But one is I was robbed when I was leaving Tesco Express. I was robbed by a band of teenage boys who wanted the vodka that I bought. And I'm sure they were waiting outside for a robbable person to exit. And that was me. Like, I'm small. I'm a woman. I was alone. And I was carrying a brown paper bag. And they were like, this bitch is going to give us what's in that bag. I like I like how you call them a band of teenage boys because like my 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 description of teenage boys is either a pack or a herd, depending on the size. They do behave like a pack. Yeah, I think as a demographic, teenage boys like really frighten me. To be honest, teenagers in general are a very disturbing sort of subspecies. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just me, but something they terrify me is that I don't think I'll ever be able to understand them anymore. Maybe I just wasn't cool as a teenager, but I definitely would not have been out waiting to rob someone around the Tesco Express. Yeah, like just watch the extended editions of Lord of the Rings like the rest of us when we were teenagers. For me, it was um Harry Potter. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. I, I know. I know. No, listen, listen. Look, I, I, I have very mixed feelings about Harry Potter, as a lot of my Instagram followers know. I tend to hate it a lot, but I hate it because it meant so much to me when I was a kid. It really did. It's the book. It's the the books were the books that got me into reading seriously. But J.K. Rowling has completely ruined any affection I have for the world, for the characters, for everything. And now I think I've substituted my personality with the, the sort of visceral hatred of Harry Potter. I think Daniel Radcliffe is very cool. I think he's the coolest one to come out of Harry Potter. Oh, yeah, he's, he's pretty, he's pretty uh, nice. I've heard he's a nice person. Uh, apparently, he was an alcoholic um, because of Harry Potter and during the filming of Harry Potter, especially Order of the Phoenix and uh, the one after that, Half-Blood Prince. Really? Yeah. He kicked his habit, though, before the filming of the seventh movie, the seventh and the eighth movies. Good for him. I did, by the way, speaking of Harry Potter, isn't it... I know we talk about J.K. Rowling being uh, kind of uh, quest, questionable when it comes to her portrayal of, you know, goblins as hook-nosed creatures that love gold. Uh, um, but isn't it also interesting that the one Irish character she mentions in her book, Seamus Finnegan, the only thing he's known for is blowing things up. His entire thing is a running joke where he just... Ah, uh, up the ra. Ooh, ah, uh, up the ra. <laughs> well, I, 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 I would like to believe that after graduating from Hogwarts, Seamus went on to join the Ra and use his wizarding skills uh, to liberate the occupied North. Well, we will discuss this in detail throughout the episode, but we just want to make a note before anyone comes for us 
We know when we're talking about women of the revolution, if you Google like Irish women revolution, the first person who's going to come up is Constance Markiewicz. Uh, She's probably the most famous one, but we're trying to give some lesser known ladies a chance to shine. So there's like no shade on her whatsoever. We don't want you to think that we are purposefully leaving her out because we don't like her. We love the Countess, but she recently had an entire exhibition at the National Gallery of Ireland. And sometimes it's just nice to recognize other people. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, we're going to share the fame, you know, share the love, spread the love. So we will do many more um, Ireland-related episodes um, in the days to come. So don't worry, this isn't just a St. Paddy's Day special, for example. Uh, Our top tier in Patreon right now is called the Connolly Collective. So we're very much aboard the Irish revolutionary train all the time on this podcast, really. This, This podcast is a friend to the provisional IRA. Um, also, this episode will be lighthearted, so unlike other depressing content, um, grab yourself an Irish whiskey or a snack, uh, or maybe an Irish coffee if you really want to uh, go out there. I have an Irish coffee. I'm sipping it right now. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm just sipping tea in a, in a mug that says, punch more Nazis. My friend got it for me for my birthday a couple of years back. Love it. Yeah. Uh, punch more Nazis and punch more tans, but we'll get to that later. Slancha. Cheers. So the Irish independence movement in the late 1910s and early 1920s was closely linked to workers' struggles and the growing feminist movement in Ireland. A lot of the players here are literally the same people, as in they are socialists, feminists, Irish nationalists, etc. They're involved in all sorts of different actions and organizations, so I don't want to tie them down to one specific channel of radicalism by simply calling them rebels or something like that. Uh, I also want to keep in mind throughout this episode how revolutionary struggles are really interconnected. Uh, And many of these women weren't simply fighting for political freedom for Ireland, but for women's liberation as well. And second, we want to note that revolutions and wars of independence really resist summary. But since we're recording a podcast episode and not writing a book, we're going to have to do some summarizing anyway. So apologies for that. And to add to all of that, um, we kind of know the word criminal is often thrown out at vulnerable people, as are words like terrorists, radical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we don't always agree that the activities of the people we discuss should be criminalized. I mean, I know this is a true crime podcast, but we'd like to take moments in this podcast to sort of uh, unpack what crime means and who gets to decide uh, what is crime and what isn't crime. And words like terrorist, criminal, they're very loaded. Um, This is definitely one of those cases. um, And we totally sympathize with the Irish revolutionaries here. And fuck the black and tans. Uh, Just because certain states criminalize certain behavior doesn't mean that we agree with it. Uh, We do have a moral conscience that guides our politics. And we talk about that often. Oh, and just as an aside, the black and tans are these British constables that were charged with putting down the Irish rebellion. The term black and tan comes from the color of the uniforms they wore because there was a shortage of uniforms and they got their uniforms from uh, returning World War I vets. They were very, very notorious for police brutality, looting, extrajudicial killings um, in Ireland to the point that there is a famous um, Irish song, uh, Irish revolutionary song that is called Come Out You Black and Tans. I'm not going to inflict my singing voice on you guys. Um, uh, it's, it is not pleasant, but you should definitely check out Kamati Black and Tans. It is definitely uh, what the kids these days call a bopping hit. We'll, um, we can add it to the show notes. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. We're just going to throw a pretty condensed timeline of the revolution at you just so you have some context to the people that we're talking about. So in the early 1900s, uh, there was growing inequality and social unrest in Ireland. And this wasn't unique to Ireland. This was happening and a lot of British colonies because capitalism was, of course, making the rich richer and the poor poor. And English kings had claimed themselves rulers of Ireland since the Norman invasion of 1169. So for the next 800 years, the British exerted various modes of control over Ireland, establishing the British ruled Kingdom of Ireland in 1542, followed by the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in 1801. And Ireland didn't have any say in this unification. Um, It was basically a way for the British to stifle dissent in Ireland and prevent the rising nationalist tendencies, because nationalism had been 
ebbing and flowing in Ireland for quite some time. Um, and we kind of see this method a lot in British colonial administration. They will allow a colony to have a parliament and a vote, but they're not allowed to vote for anything meaningful like independence or getting rid of landlords or having serious workers reforms, nothing like that. So it's, it's all performative. It's all for show. And in 1912, the British government introduces the idea of home rule for Ireland, which would allow them much more political autonomy. And this was considered a win for Irish nationalists, but it wasn't independence. In 1913, the Ulster Volunteer Force was founded to oppose home rule in Ireland. Uh, the UVF is fiercely loyal to the British crown and would later resurface, actually, during the Troubles as an agitator. And ironically enough, the UVF was reached the point of extremism that it was willing to fight the British government to maintain British government control rather than have independence for Ireland. Uh, we see we saw this in the Troubles where the UVF fought both Republicans and the British state to maintain the British occupation of the North. Uh, this type of terrorism uh, might seem counterintuitive, but we've seen parallel organizations like the Haganah in British Mandatory Palestine, which counted on British colonial rule for power and institutional legitimacy, but would also fight against the Brits when things didn't go totally their way. 1913 also saw a critical moment for Ireland's labor movement. The Dublin lockout was an industrial dispute between thousands of workers and their employers. When workers protested poor and unsafe conditions and tried to unionize, bosses locked them out of their workplaces and uh, employed strike breakers, while workers engaged in tactics like strikes, rallies, walkouts, and so on. Uh, the nearly five-month lockout is considered to have ended badly for the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, but it did establish workers... Uh, it did establish principles of union actions and worker solidarity in Ireland. It also brought together workers, activists, and intellectuals who would continue fighting for Irish independence. I mean, we've seen we've seen sort of uh, a lot of occasions uh, where a particular event failed, but it acted as a fuel for future successes. Right. And that's why I think even movements we go into expecting to fail are important because you're gathering together like-minded individuals who might participate in future activism. You're changing the conversation, especially around capitalism. And you're showing that even if we aren't successful, we won't just go away. And if you've been involved in any kind of local activism, you probably know, at least where I live, it's like all the same people. Like if you go to an anti-capitalist event or a free Palestine event or a feminist event, 80% of the people are the same. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the same. It's the same rotating door of faces here as well. Like every every Palestine event, every anti capitalist event, every sort of solidarity with Venezuela or Cuba or what have you. It's the same like couple of dozen people. It's very. Uh, it's very much repeated. And as we'll discuss momentarily, women were really instrumental in the Dublin lockout, and they will go on to be a really important part of Irish republicanism. And this is where a lot of them, you know, met and built these associations. So later when things started kicking off again, they were like, I know who to call. I know who is in solidarity with me. And that's such an important part of grassroots organizing. Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? Constance Barkovitz. <laughs> uh, so 1913 saw the formation of groups like James Connolly's Socialist Irish Citizen Army, which is called the ICA, and also the Irish Volunteers. The next year, 1914, uh, specifically on April 2nd, so right around now, there was the formation of an organization called Kuma Naman, which translates to the Irish Women's Council in English. Uh, it's an, a women's Irish Republican paramilitary organization. 1916 saw the Easter Rising, which was an armed insurrection against British rule, which at first seemed like a total defeat for the rebels again, but it would turn into a beacon of support for Irish independence, and women were involved in this as well. 77 were arrested and imprisoned for the activities, and they also galvanized public support for the movement. So a couple years later, uh, in 1919 to 1921, women played crucial roles in the War of Independence. They weren't simply the wives, sisters, and mothers of agents of history, as we so often hear about revolutionary women, you know, only people who are related to men, the agents. But women gathered intelligence, they transported and stored weapons, they organized fighters, 
they dispatched messages, and they nursed wounded soldiers and raised funds and awareness about the cause. A truce was agreed between the British government and some Irish Republicans in 1921, which would see Ireland partitioned, with 26 counties earning independence and the remaining six under the control of the United Kingdom. A civil war broke out between the pro- and anti-treaty forces, which lasted for 11 months, and Kuma Naman, the women's organization, also split into pro- and anti-treaty blocs. Of course, we know now that the pro-treaty free state forces won that war, and Ireland is now divided into two parts, the 26-county Republic of Ireland and the six counties still occupied by Britain. Irish Republicans frequently refer to these six counties as the occupied six counties or the north of Ireland, and unionists use other terms like Ulster or the province, and broadcast programs in Britain typically use Northern Ireland, which is the area's name on passports and things like that, uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, and some stations in the Republic just say the North. So we usually throughout the podcast call it the North of Ireland. The status of the North of Ireland is still a contested matter. And we're not going to do a really deep dive into it right now because the troubles really deserve more attention than we could give to them in a sidebar. We will say, though, that politics in Ireland and especially the North, are often mistakenly boiled down to a question of identity, of Catholics versus Protestants. This is the wrong way of looking at things. People in all parts of Ireland are concerned about things like labor issues, housing, health care, and rights for marginalized groups, and it's really reductive and myopic to characterize centuries of colonial exploitation as a sectarian religious dispute. So the first Irish revolutionary woman we want to discuss is Miss Eileen Bell. And just a quick note, this is not the politician from the North of Ireland's Alliance Party. Uh, If you Google Eileen Bell Ireland, that's who will come up. We're talking about a different Eileen Bell. There actually aren't that many Irish names, really. Once our friend Dermid went to hospital in Ireland for an injury, and the doctor treating him had the exact same first and last name as him. I feel like it's kind of the same for Arabic names, to be honest. Uh, I'm not so sure. I know their first names are very like repetitive. There is like a pool of first names, and almost everyone is either a Muhammad or an Ahmad or whatever. Uh, but on the last name basis, there are there is a lot more diversity when it comes to last names. In Jordan, when I introduced myself as Aaron, people always used to ask me if I was Kurdish, which was really confusing to me because I am not Kurdish. And finally, ex- someone explained to me that Aireen is a Kurdish name, and I was spelling Aaron in Arabic the exact same way. And obviously, Kurdistan is much closer to Jordan than Ireland, so it made sense that people would assume horses and not zebras, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, our Eileen was born in Dublin in 1903 into a very Republican family. And just as a note here, when we say Republican, we don't mean Republican in the American sense. We mean Republican as an Irish Republican, the cool Republicans, if you will. Her grandfather was a member of a group called the Fenians, which, by the way, uh, has also been used as a slur against Catholics. So I would, if I was you, I wouldn't go around calling people Fenians. It's been used as a slur by non-Catholics towards Catholics, especially in Scotland and Ireland. And at like sporting events in particular. Oh yeah, a lot of a lot of the sort of targeted abuse that the fans of Celtic um, in Glasgow get um, from fans of Rangers and other clubs is to be called Fenians. But that's a whole other uh, sidebar altogether. Um, the Fenians in this case were an earlier group of Irish Republicans who attempted to stage uprisings throughout the late uh, 19th century without much military success. The group, however, became reasonably popular with Irish workers and Irish immigrants to North America. Thousands of Fenian brothers were arrested by the colonial authorities, and many were incarcerated abroad in Britain or Australia. And you see this actually uh, very regularly. It's something that Britain was really good at, is whenever they arrest people who are trying to seek national liberation, their go-to is to incarcerate them somewhere far away from their homeland. Uh, We've seen that with a lot of Egyptian uh, freedom fighters being uh, exiled to Ceylon, which is modern-day Sri Lanka. Uh, It's it's a very common colonial tactic. Uh, In any case, um, Eileen's grandfather was jailed at Mountjoy Prison in Dublin, which, unlike Kilmainham Jail, remains an operational prison to this day. 
Eileen's mother volunteered at the soup kitchens during the Dublin lockout in 1913, and Eileen, being the eldest of 10 children, probably acted as kind of a sidekick to her mother, which would have been a pretty common role for a household's eldest daughter at the time. I think it's still pretty common now for the oldest girl to be her mother's helper, you know, whether she wants to or not. So Eileen was exposed to Irish republicanism and the workers' movement at a very young age. In 1920, the Irish War of Independence was in full throttle, and 17-year-old Eileen was working as a tie maker in Dublin. She decided to join the Drumcondra branch of Kuma Naman to do her part in the revolutionary struggle. And just as a side note, there's plenty of well-known Irish people from Drumcondra, but one of them you might have heard of is the rapper Reggie Snow. One of Eileen's jobs, among many, was to stash weapons for the IRA. According to Liz Gillis, the Brits raided the Bell House many times, as the family members were known Republicans, but they never managed to find any contraband. In one instance, while the Tan searched her home, Eileen laid under her covers and hoped they would leave her alone. Of course, Eileen was only a, a teenage girl, so the soldiers ignored her. They left the house unable to find the gun, as Eileen had hidden it under her pillow while she pretended to sleep. Eileen later joined the anti-treaty side of the Irish Civil War, and it seemed as though she put her weapon smuggling skills to use once more. She was at Barry's Hotel in Gardner Row, where the anti-treaty forces first set up their base of operations. Barry's Hotel is also still in operation, and according to one person's Google review, it's clean, cheap, and really central, which is why it was an IRA headquarters. Eileen would go on to marry a Scottish man named Thomas Glynn, and they lived in Scotland for a while before returning to Dublin at the onset of World War II. They ended up having five children, three sons and two daughters, and settling down on Galtimore Road in Drimna. A woman named Mary Boyce, who had also been a Kuma Naman member, lived on the same street, and Mary and Eileen stayed close friends for the rest of their lives. Like we said in the beginning of the episode, this is a very wholesome episode. So enjoy your uh, Irish coffee while you're reading this. I think it's very sweet. It is cute. It is adorable. The second last we want to talk about is Miss Molly O'Reilly. Unlike Eileen, Molly didn't come from a Republican family. Actually, her father was very loyal to Britain. And I think too often people wrongfully assume that women and girls become involved in these politics because they're just following the men and their family. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I know this is shocking to some people, but women can think for ourselves. When Molly was only nine years old, she went to Liberty Hall to learn Irish dancing and heard James Connolly speak. She was captivated by his message, and she knew she wanted to be a part of the independence movement. Like Eileen, Molly was involved in the lockout, volunteering at soup kitchens and collecting donations for the cause. She was only 11 years old and often ran messages back and forth for Connolly alongside his children. Molly was also involved in the 1914 Hoth gun running. So the Irish volunteers had decided to purchase about 1,500 Mauser rifles that dated to the Franco-Prussian War. They knew that the UVF, their nemesis, had been stockpiling weapons, and there had already been a few skirmishes between the Republicans and the British Army. A lot of the volunteers only had, like, varmint rifles, which could be used for combat, but weren't really ideal. So they decided to purchase some guns from a dealer in Hamburg, and then had to transfer them from Germany to Ireland. And the guns were first shipped to Belgium, and then the volunteers used a private boat to bring them to Hoth, which is a harbor town near Dublin. And the boat is a gaff rig sailboat called the Asgard, and you can still see it at the Collins Barracks in Dublin. Uh, the government actually tracked it down and then refurbished it. So on the 26th of July, 1914, the boat arrived and a bunch of Republicans, led by Countess Markovitz, arrived to collect the guns. They started unloading the rifles into wheelbarrows in broad daylight, and obviously the harbor master immediately noticed and called the police and the army to stop the gun running. The soldiers arrived, but by this point, a load of people had showed up to catch a glimpse of the rifles, and the people revolted against the soldiers trying to take the guns away. So the police were only able to seize about 19 out of 1,500 rifles, and the volunteers got away with the rest. From the sounds of it, the Republicans weren't really armed beyond gardening tools and such. They had the rifles that they were unloading, but I think they were able to fight off the soldiers by just like holding on to the guns really tight and refusing to let go. Uh, so later that day, 
When the soldiers were walking back to their barracks, a crowd gathered to make fun of them for not being able to take the guns out of the hands of most <laughs> unarmed civilians. <laughs> Met most of them were children. They were literal children. <laughs> it is it is objectively hilarious. But uh, the troops fired on the crowd, killing three people and injuring 38. And the incident is now known as the Bachelor's Walk Massacre, which, I mean, how could you not laugh at armed British soldiers not being able to take away guns from kids with shovels. <laughs> okay, look, it, in the and I can't, I can't believe I'm saying this, but in the defense of armed soldiers, have you ever tried to take something out of the hands of a kid who really wants something? It is not as easy as it looks. Our girl Molly uh, was a part of this. She stored some of the Mao's arrivals in her family home, all without the knowledge of her father, who was a loyalist. So... Pretty badass, in my opinion. I agree. When she was only 14 years old, James Connolly asked Molly if she would do the special duty of raising the ICA flag over Liberty Hall before the Easter Rising, which she did. During the Rising, she carried messages between the soldiers. She managed to evade arrest, probably because she was a 14-year-old girl, and went to England to study nursing, but soon returned to Ireland to join the Kuminamanon, uh, I think I pronounced that right. Kuminamon? Kuminamon. Kuminamon. Kuminamon, that's the one. Um, and the fight for independence. Molly took a job at the coffee shop on Dawson Street in Dublin, owned by Constance Markovitz and Charlotte Despard, so that she could commit herself to the struggle, revolutionary struggle. Of course, her employers didn't mind if she took time off work once in a while to deliver messages or transport arms. Molly would bring explosives like gelignite, to the IRA in Dalkey for operations against the Black and Tans. During the Irish Civil War, Molly took the anti-treaty side and was arrested and jailed in 1923. Molly went on hunger strike, which actually has a long tradition in Ireland as a form of protest. In pre-Christian Ireland, people used to fast in order to recover debts or get justice for a perceived wrong. For example, if someone died and one family member was responsible for distributing their possessions and screwed the rest of the family over, the family would start fasting to get the attention of the other people in town. Like, hey, this guy is such a stingy dick, we have to starve ourselves. So then the townspeople would also apply pressure to the stingy dick until he divided the assets fairly. There's a very similar practice uh, in India as well, and it's now used around the world as a form of protest, especially by prisoners. In 1923, up to 8,000 IRA prisoners went on hunger strike to demonstrate against their incarceration by the new Irish Free State. Women like Molly were among them. Molly was released 16 days after her strike began. Molly married another IRA member named Ned Corcoran, and they had five children, four sons, and one daughter named Constance, after Molly's friend Constance Markovitz. Molly and Ned are both buried in Glasnevin Cemetery, where Molly's headstone notes that she was honored by James Connolly to hoist that flag up over Liberty Hall before the Easter Rising. I mean, that is that is as happy an ending as you can get. It is the happily ever after of revolutionary struggles. Yeah, Molly seemed like a cool, cool gal. Okay, I believe that we've saved the best story for last. The life of Irish revolutionary Margaret Skinner. Margaret wrote a book about her experience called Doing My Bit for Ireland, which I was able to obtain a digital copy of on Project Gutenberg. Miss Skinner wrote the book while she was in the United States, giving a lecture tour about her experiences. If you're interested in a very personal account of the Easter Rising, and one which is unique in its gender perspective, I would definitely recommend checking out this book. So Margaret Skinner was born near Glasgow to Irish parents in 1892 or 93. This was also where James Connolly was born. There were actually a good number of Irish people living in working class communities in Scotland at the time, especially following the Great Famine, otherwise known as the Potato Famine, in the late 1840s. Attitudes towards these immigrants were mixed. On one hand, we have instances where the Irish made very clear attempts to integrate into the community, and we can still see the effects of that today. Think Hibernian, Celtic, and Dundee football clubs. On the other hand, the Irish face discrimination that doesn't sound unlike the position many xenophobes take towards immigrants today. For example, the 1871 Scottish census reports, the immigration of such a number of people from the lowest class and with no education will have a bad effect on the population. 
So far, living among the Scots does not seem to have improved the Irish, but the native Scots who live among the Irish have gotten worse. It is difficult to imagine the effect of the Irish immigrants will have upon the morals and habits of the Scottish people. End quote. What a bunch of dicks, honestly. As if, as if the Scots were saints before the Irish showed up. Really? Republicanism still thrived in Glasgow's Irish community, and one has to wonder whether the animosity Irish immigrants face in Scotland contributed to their support for Irish independence. Like, if the Irish had been able to just seamlessly integrate into Scottish communities, then they'd probably focus their political energy on Scottish rather than Irish issues, you know, and, and drop it, really. But such was not the case. Glasgow had its own branch of Kumanaman, which Margaret Skinner joined while she was working as a teacher. Margaret decided her skills would be better put to use in Ireland, so she decided to move to her parents' home country. Like Eileen and Molly, Margaret was involved in couriering messages and weapons smuggling. She transported detonators for bombs in her hat. Unlike Eileen and Molly, however, Margaret trained to shoot rifles as well. She had been a member of a rifle club in Scotland, which, according to Wikipedia at least, was set up to teach women to shoot so they could defend the British Empire. Obviously, Margaret had different applications in her mind. During the Easter Rising, Margaret served as a sniper right alongside the men. She writes in her autobiography. Madame had had a fine uniform of green moleskin made for me. With her usual generosity, she had mine made of better material than her own. It consisted of knee breeches, belted coat, and putties. I slipped into this uniform, climbed up astride the rafters, and was assigned a loophole through which to shoot. Whenever I was called down to carry a dispatch, I took off my uniform, put on my gray dress and hat, and went out the side door of the college with my message. As soon as I returned, I slipped back into my uniform and joined the firing squad. So Margaret's garrison was stationed at the Royal College of Surgeons, shooting at the British soldiers on the roof of the Shelbourne Hotel. Both of these places are still around. The Shelbourne is actually now owned by the Marriott, and it's really, really expensive to stay there or like have Sunday brunch. Also, as an aside, there is a branch of the Royal College of Surgeons in uh, Bahrain as well. They're, they're very much expanding. The same one? Yeah, like the the people the people will do their studies in Bahrain, and then um, in the final year they'll send uh, the students to Ireland to complete their studies. Interesting. Both the Shelbourne and the Royal College of Surgeons, the Dublin branch in this case, also have some really creepy ghost stories attached to them. If you're into that sort of thing, but so does pretty much every other church or pub in Dublin. It's a really haunted city, uh, full of ghost stories. Halloween actually descends from an Irish pagan holiday called Samhain, which occurs at the autumn equinox, marking the end of the harvest and the night that the boundary between humans and the other world is blurred. And even ancient mythology texts describe the festival as a drinking holiday, which is fitting, I would think. Uh, honestly, if, if there was one day where the dead would come back to life, I would need a drink or 10. Similar to the contemporary Day of the Dead, some believe that their deceased loved ones could reappear on Samhain and they would set places for their deceased family members at the dinner table, which is nice. Um, this, is, this is a notice to all my family members and friends. When I die, please don't put a uh, place for me on your table. I want to remain dead. I don't want to come back. I would like a glass of wine if I have to come back. That's what I'm requesting. Yeah, if, I, if you make me come back, you better ply me with a lot of drinks. If you had to haunt somewhere, where do you think you would haunt? Uh, depends. Are we like, like if, we, if we're haunting someplace, do we feel like the same feelings as humans, like hot, cold, uh, like the ink weather and so on? Because if so, then I'd haunt somewhere nice, like a warm beach. Uh, but if not, then I would haunt a city like maybe Dublin, maybe Rome. Like an ancient city. Maybe like Alexandria, actually. That would be, be a nice haunting. Yeah, that would be a good haunt. What about you? Wow, yours is... I was going to say, like, it depends who I need to seek vengeance on. <laughs> that, that makes sense, too. You know, so I would pick their basement and I would go down there and I'd make spooky sounds, you know? Yeah. In Irish folklore, there's actually a lot of hauntings and, I don't know, creepy things happening. 
Irish folklore has fairies, which would be at their most mischievous on Samhain. And in Irish folklore, the Aishi, which is, it's basically like fairies or elves, they used to kidnap people and replace them with changelings, which are body doubles. So basically, they would kidnap usually a child, they'd kidnap a child in the family and then replace it with an identical child, which would apparently act strange and like, I mean, I don't actually believe in this at all, but like you risked being accused of being a changeling. <laughs> but like, what's the purpose of that? Like, what do they do with the the original child? Oh, I think they like harvest magic and like raise it as their own. I don't exactly know. Hmm. Okay. But there's um, there's a pretty famous case. This woman named Bridget Cleary was accused by her husband of being a changeling. And then he killed her. I don't think she was burnt at the stake, but it, it had similar kind of sexist, witchcrafty accusation vibes, you know. But like if, if someone accuses you of being a changeling, how can you prove that you're not? It's such a dumb accusation. I know that one way you identify a changeling is you have to wait until they think they're alone and then they'll start like talking to themselves and like mumbling like I'm a changeling or something like that but first of all when I think I'm by myself I do weird shit all the time <laughs> oh same here no like I talk to myself as well but it's mostly like just keeping things in mind like running a list of things to do for example um, which I feel like is not entirely abnormal this is my weird embarrassing fact I listen to a podcast a lot called Red Handed. If you haven't heard of it, uh, look it up. And both the speakers are British. And when I type notes for our podcast episodes, I read them out loud to myself in a British accent. And there's your fun fact for the day. I know. <laughs> I'm not British, not even a little bit. I did live there for a while, I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry to hear that. I was never robbed outside of Tesco in London, <laughs> so take that as you will. <laughs> Scottish and Irish mythology also has a creature. It's similar to a siren. It's called a selkie. It's just it's one of my favorite ones. Selkies, they sing haunting songs. They lure sailors to their doom. But unlike mermaids, selkies travel the seas as seals, and then they can shed their seal skin and turn into beautiful women. Like entire women or just the upper half is women and the bottom? No, half entire women. women. Like they like unzip the seal skin like a coat and then come out. Are they hot? Yeah. Hey, man. I mean, I, as I, women, I, I not that. as seals. <laughs> I unless... do them either ways. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a picky person. Seal, woman, same thing to me. Um, the ancient Celts also believed in a creature called an Elplochra which was an invisible newt that would crawl into people's throats and then feast on the food that they had eaten. And a person with an elp locra would have a really hard time gaining and keeping on weight. And in order to get rid of it, you'd have to eat a lot of salted meat and then sit near a stream with your mouth open so that it could like get thirsty and crawl out. And now we know that an elp locra probably could have had a medical explanation like a tapeworm or a cancerous tumor. And it's just kind of an interesting way to look at how mythology really does explain naturally occurring phenomenon, you know? Yeah, I mean, on the tapeworm uh, side, the reason pork was prohibited in Islam is because of outbreaks of uh, various parasites that came from eating um, untreated pork in the area in Arabia. So the the sort of the, the religious ban on pork that Muhammad when when establishing Islam uh sort of perpetuated came from a sign like a sort of a mythological way of preventing parasite infections. There's definitely a couple historical moments where people in Europe got sick from eating contaminated pork, but Jewish people didn't because Jewish people who keep kosher don't eat pork. And the Christians being the anti-Semites and ignorant, you know, medically ignorant people that they were, accused the Jewish community of like poisoning them. Oh, Jesus Christ. That that is that, that is some big brain Christianity right there. We'll talk about it. We're doing um probably as our bonus episode next week, an episode on the plague. But Jewish people were frequently accused of like poisoning the entire rest of the town. 
which in the circumstance of the plague doesn't even make sense because Jewish people also got the plague. <laughs> but it's also fascinating because like today you'll hear things like Judeo-Christian values as if Judaism and Christianity were always like in some sort of sync. But like for the most part of history, Christianity reviled and um, completely despised Judaism as a religion and Jews as a community. They wash their hands and they don't eat your dirty pig meat. Which, by the way, I, I've never, like, pork is so overrated. Like, I tried bacon and I've tried pork and I'm like, mm, I, don't, I don't see the appeal here. Moving back toward, back toward Dublin here, uh, the Shelbourne Hotel is allegedly haunted by the ghost of a little girl named Mary Masters who died of cholera there in 1846. And the actress, Lily Collins, told Jimmy Fallon, you can look up this uh, this clip, that when she stayed at the Shelbourne, she was, like, bothered by the ghost of Mary. So take that as you will. Some people say it's a real thing. Uh, the Brazen Head is another pub. It claims to be the oldest pub in Dublin, but, like, lots of them do. And the ghost of the Irish nationalist leader, Robert Emmett, is said to hang out there. But I've been to that pub a couple times, and I have never seen hide nor hair of him. Does he just, like, hang out, like, casually, or does he, like, haunt the place? Oh, no. Apparently, he, like, sits at his spot on the bar and, like, nurses a drink, which wouldn't that, if that was happening, there would be no dispute. Like <laughs> That seems like a very cut and dry situation to me. I don't believe in ghosts, really. I'm I'm not big on the supernatural, but I will say... It kind of makes sense to just like hang out at your favorite pub, be like, this is my spot at the bar. Just because I'm dead doesn't mean I can't have a Guinness. Yeah, honestly, going back to your question about where I'd haunt, chances are I'd probably pick a pub and not necessarily haunt the pub, but like hang out at the pub, just sort of sit there, have a drink, read what I, what I do now, basically, but I'm a ghost instead of a normal person. If I had to pay for the drinks... I would pick the divey pubs where I normally go. But if I didn't have to pay for the drinks because, like, go drink free, I'd pick a nice cocktail lounge. That's smart. That's really smart. We should we should pass some uh, legislation decrying that ghosts don't have to pay for anything. I think you and I should say right now, ghosts have free access to our Patreon. Yes. They, they have access to all of the, up to the $10 uh, level. They're, they have complete access. Right. If you're a ghost, just log on and listen to that. Yeah. And let us know. Um, rate, rate our podcast um, and tell your ghost friends, your ghost pals. Your ghosts, your specters, your apparitions. Yeah, your poltergeists, poltergeists. Well, how, how are you pronounce that? Poltergeists? Poltergeists? Poltergeists. Poltergeists, yeah. Anyways, back to the Easter Rising. When we left Margaret, she was shooting at British soldiers on the roof of the Shelburne. Later, the Irish citizen army spotted British soldiers near their headquarters on Harcourt Street and decided to try and force the soldiers to move by setting fire to some houses on the street. Margaret was engaged in this operation, and she was shot three times by the Brits, but survived. Margaret Skinner was the only woman wounded while fighting in the Easter Rising. She went to the hospital to receive medical treatment, and unlike many of the other volunteers, she wasn't arrested there likely because the enemies weren't initially looking for a woman. According to Margaret, a government detective did come looking for her there, uh, but the doctors told the detective that Margaret was in no condition to leave the hospital and go to prison, so he would have to come back for her later. Before he could come back, Margaret healed enough that she felt safe to leave the hospital, and she fled to Glasgow and then to the United States. In New York, Margaret spoke at rallies in support of the Irish Republicans, gathering American support for their cause. The independence movement was able to gain significant help from Americans, especially in East Coast cities. I'm not sure about this time period, but definitely later in the 1970s, Catholic charities, and like using Catholic in scare quotes here, used to go around to the Irish pubs in New York and Boston collecting money for the children, which was usually a cover to buy weapons for the IRA. Like if someone came around with a bucket saying, we're collecting money for the children, People knew that the money was for weapons. Hey, I don't know about you, but I do think children need uh, armor lights as well. I mean, it was kids who took those weapons off uh, the Asgard in Hoth. So, 
Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, Margaret did return to Ireland to take part in the War of Independence, and in the following civil war, she took the anti-treaty side. At one point, she was the quartermaster general of the IRA, which was a pretty high position. Uh, she was arrested in 1922 for possessing a revolver and first imprisoned in Mountjoy. After a 12-day hunger strike, Margaret and 11 other women were moved to the North Dublin Union internment camp. After her release from prison, Margaret Skinner worked as a teacher and a union activist for the rest of her life. At one point, she was even president of the Irish National Teachers Organization. She also had to fight with the Irish government to receive her pension from the 1916 uprising, which they initially wouldn't give to her because she was a woman. She won a pension for herself and for other women as well, and she remained a feminist activist until her death in 1971. She is buried in Glasnevin Cemetery near Constance Markovitz. Uh, so those are the three women that we wanted to pay our respects to around this Easter uh, if you do celebrate Easter, we wish you a really happy Easter. If you celebrate Passover, we wish you a Chag Pesach. Am I saying that right? Chag Pesach? I think it's Chag Pesach. Maybe it's a Cha. I don't know. But we hope you have a great uh, Passover or Easter or just a great weekend and that you're staying safe. Yeah. If you like the show, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast. Uh, leave us a review um, on that app of choice. Uh, if you really like us, become a Patreon on www.patreon.com slash Daskriminal, D-A-S-C-R-I-M-I-N-A-L. Uh, you'll get all sorts of benefits uh, like shout outs. So shout out to Tim, uh, who subscribed to the Connolly Collective. Uh, thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Also a shout out to my mom, one of our favorite Irish women. Thanks, Erin's mom. Um, and you'll also get access to exclusive Patreon polls and fan requests, but monthly bonus content, including full length episodes and the warm, fuzzy feeling, knowing that you're helping support the show and the cause. Um, and as we say here, money for the children, money for the children, um, follow our socials, uh, at Dust Criminal Pod. Uh, you can rate us five stars and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps uh, when people search for the show. The shows with more five-star reviews come up first. So if someone searches something like Women Irish Revolution, our podcast will be higher ranked if we have more good reviews. So it's a simple and free way to really help us out. Um, also, just tell your friends. The more people that listen... Uh, the more we'll get to enjoy the stuff that we're putting out. If you enjoy it, please let other people know. Think of this like a pyramid scheme. You tell your friends, they tell their friends, those friends tell their friends, and everyone's happy. Exactly. Um, but really, thank you guys so much for listening. We hope that you're all staying safe and warm during quarantine. Yeah, take care, everyone. Until next time.